Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Hi everybody and welcome to the garage. I'm Jeremy Cordeaux, Peter Clayton's behind the camera. What did they call this, Pete? Hump day. Hump, hump day? Yeah, well it's Wednesday, it's the middle of the week. I have never heard that expression before. <laughs> well, you okay. get Monday and you get Tuesday and then there's Wednesday. Once you're over the hump, you're almost there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I think it's fairly commonly called hump day. Good old Wednesday. Oh look, I went to the auctions. And I like to show you things that I, I managed to get. Um, when I'm proud of getting a bargain, you know, at, at an op shop or a second-hand store or whatever. Now, I don't know if that's in frame, but yes, it is. It's an old Ericsson phone, and I looked at it and I thought, oh. That's going to be expensive. It's a little dusty, I must admit. It's in really lovely condition. There are a few little marks on it, but... And its age, I don't know. But I just love the look of that. You know, for us to go from this to the mobile telephone is just ridiculous. This is how people communicate it for years and if it wasn't this it was a war phone an old Ericsson war phone Ericsson and Stromberg Carlson I think made most of the telephones that were used in the Western world but I think it's just lovely and I paid $80 for it nobody else wanted it which in itself is sad because that's just the most beautiful it's almost a work of art piece of jewelry anyway i'm i'm very happy i'm very happy yeah i think you should be jeremy that I is am. lovely yes i am eighty dollars is a lot of money but not for that that's just marvelous anyway happy wednesday to you uh, where do we start? A big rethink of our naval capabilities or capacities. Now, when you, when you look at our defence spending, it's about $50 billion a year, which is more than our required 2% of GDP. I think most countries are required to, by either treaty or common sense, to spend about 2% on defence. Well, we're spending more than that. It's, it's about uh, 50.2 billion. Mind you, at the same time, we're spending this year 60 billion on the NDIS. And at the Minister's own uh, comment, we can we can work on the fact that a lot of it is wasted and in fact put into the hands of criminals organized crime bill shorten said that anyway i don't know where you would rather your taxpayer dollars went i have no idea but really when you consider the coastline of australia which is i had to look it up because i had no idea 58 thousand eight hundred kilometers that's a hell of a lot of coastline and it's an impossible task really we have one serviceable Collins class submarine and we have 11 surface ships most of them are tied up in various docks in uh, Sydney Garden Island here and mostly Western Australia and Sydney now, the plan is, according to the federal government, 
yesterday, the plan is to build that up to 26 surface ships. The Hunter class frigates will be cut back and that's a big blow to South Australia because we do not want to find ourselves in a situation where we are the major shipbuilding state in the country and we have this kind of valley of death where uh, the ships that we are making are completed and government for one reason or another haven't got another project in mind. They're going to cut the frigates back from six to nine. Well, I'm, other way around. I nine, mean, they're going to cut it back six. from nine to six. That's what I mean. Look, I don't really honestly think they know what they're doing. Whatever the plan or the announcement, we know that it'll probably change over time. We think we need today certain things. The world changes and tomorrow we might need a completely different capacity. But looking at that coastline of ours, particularly the northern coastline, and our vulnerability to people who simply want perfectly reasonably a better place to live, we are a logical target. So if you're going to build boats, new, a new surface fleet, wouldn't you be trying to build maneuverable, fast patrol boats to cover and protect Northern Australia? I want to try and get Rex Patrick, who was a submariner, and he was a senator for South Australia. Uh, I'm not sure what he's doing at the moment. I think he's doing a bit of consulting work on things naval and military. I'm going to try and get him on the show on Friday morning. Um, did you go over and see Taylor Swift's show? <laughs> hey Pete, what would you do for an audience like that? Oh jeez. Oh. A hundred thousand yeah, screaming. I, I, I don't, I'd, be, I'd be shaking too much. I couldn't do anything, but <laughs> it, it would be a dream come true for her as well. Well, um, Pretty sure she's used to it. I think it's her biggest crowd ever. Yeah, look. Yeah, biggest crowd look, ever. It wouldn't surprise me. And she's got uh, uh, Melbourne and now Sydney this week out at the Olympic, you know, the old Olympic place at Homebush. That's, that, that can probably accommodate more than 100,000 people. Anyway, it's a juggernaut. Jeremy, did you know that she's, she's given millions millions of dollars uh, away to charities and things. Oh, she's a, uh, she's a like remarkable woman. Something million dollars she's given away. She is a remarkable woman. I must say, I, I, I used to love, or not love, but I used to like and appreciate her songs when she was more of a, a country singer. Uh, she'd have a, a country hat on and jeans and a check shirt and she'd, she'd kind of sing songs. But she's gone through that stage and she's now, she's now found this, this uh, uh, entity, which is remarkable. Now what they have to do in Melbourne at the MCG is to spend a million dollars to repair the turf... <laughs> You made a million dollars to fix up the grass at the MCG. 96,000 to 100,000, mostly women and girls, enjoyed a three-hour concert. I heard somebody on 3AW say it was just too long. It was lovely, 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 but too long. The other problem was the toilets. Apparently because uh, it was mostly a female audience, you couldn't get anywhere near the women's toilets. They couldn't cope. So, do you know what most women and girls did? They just merrily went off to the men's. Boys and girls using the same John, side by side, quite happily. Worked well, no problems, no complaints. Uh, maybe that's the future, I don't know. And that's not even unisex, that's just, well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to stand there in this huge line of people, I'm never going to make it. So, you know, mother is the invention, well, necessity is the mother of invention. 
the interesting thing about Taylor is that, yes, she has a fan base. But what we see is more of a movement, a real grassroots movement that she has created over 20 years. Now, I don't know if there's some Svengali behind her pulling the strings and telling her what to do and creating it, or it's all her own work. You know, uh, musical taste over 20 years changes a lot. But she has ridden this through and she has built a phenomenal career. So what's next? I have never spoken to her. Don't know very much about her either, apart from those early days of singing country songs, sitting on a bale of hay. But there is not a politician or a theologian, an author or a monarch on the planet who could pull a crowd like that night after night. What a merchandising juggernaut. And what if she wanted to run for public office? Well, in America, she'd probably start off going for uh, governor somewhere. But <laughs> she would win hands down. And I like that. I think that could be wonderful. The people know what they like. And they like what they know. Um, I can't give it to you today, but hopefully tomorrow the uh, wage price index figures they're not much of an in indicator but they are you know part of the process of working out where our economy is at the moment and really God knows where that is what can we do about prices oh people have tried before I was talking to Andy and Pete earlier today about the ACTU solo petrol stations. Do you remember them? When Bob Hawke was the head of the ACTU, he didn't like what the Saudi Arabians were doing to our petrol prices. So he said, look, I know we've got thousands of members, hundreds of thousands of members of the trade union movement. We'll just open our own petrol stations and we will get our own independent supply of petrol blah 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 I don't think Bob brilliant politician I don't know that he was an economist anyway that didn't happen people didn't go to ACTU solo to buy their petrol at a cheap price I think it closed or went bankrupt then there was Burke's department store, opened again by Bob Hawke for much the same reason. There was the half case warehouse, I remember here in South Australia, which offered uh, households a huge discount on their grossly, uh, uh, weekend or weekly grocery and uh, vegetable purchases. Then there was Farmer Bob in Sydney, Farmer Bob in Sydney was Bobby Lim, who was riding high with his uh, Sound of Music program on Channel 10. I remember it well. And he decided he was going to open a, uh, a kind of a, a market, farmer's market thing in Sydney with his celebrity, Lay Down Mazaire. That would work. It didn't. Bilo was a big company here in Adelaide. It was swallowed up by Coles, I think. Warmolds was a big name in Sydney. Anyway, I, I, I come to this. Four Corners had a very good look at Coles and Woolworths, mostly a critical look on Monday night. Big is definitely not beautiful according to the ABC. I'd be fascinated to see a Four Corners program on the ABC. <laughs> I'm dreaming, of course. That'll never happen. But back to reality. Ultimately, we do have options. 
Now, I go to Drake's. I think Drake's. We spoke to John Paul Drake at the dining room table, not last Friday, I think the Friday before. Anyway, we're talking about Australia Day and his brand of patriotism. We've got Foodland, we've got Aldi, we've got the local IGA. The duopoly of Coles and Woolworths is vulnerable. Not us. We the people. Not us. Customers. Shoppers. We simply don't go there. They're stuffed. We have power. I know the show made a very big thing of power in the power imbalance. These, these guys are too big, the argument was. And the poor farmer has to take it or leave it when Coles and Woolworths come calling or come buying. Well, no, it is a market. A market at the wholesale level, a market at the retail level. They don't have to sell, we don't have to buy. You can't blame people for using their market power to benefit their shareholders. That is their fiduciary duty. That's their job. They're not a charity. But they do have to be aware of their relationship with the community. We can't vilify people for being successful. Coles and Woolworths revolutionized shopping with their supermarket concept, which was back in the, oh, very late 50s, early 60s. But I mean, but who am I? I don't know. I sit here in my garage surrounded by my 1950s and 1960s cars I like, and my old telephone. I like old fashioned. Not everybody does. It's what makes the world interesting. The ABC thinks that the big two should be in a continuous price war to the benefit of the shopper. And that sounds good, might please the ABC, but where's the sense? I think we can all understand why the current business model makes sense to them, not to us. But as I say, we do not have to shop there. For God's sake, just let market forces work their magic. I go to Foodland or Drake's, Caroline goes to Aldi. If we all did this, we would have an immediate correction. Keep in mind, these bad guys, by the way, employ 300,000 Australians. Angus Grigg, who did the story on Four Corners, I'd like to get him on the show on Friday. Maybe he wouldn't be allowed to talk to me. I don't know. Then we have to consider all the chemist chains. Chemist warehouse. God, I can tell you they use their market power. Then we could talk about the hardware chains and the bottle shops. Do you imagine these people don't use their market power? Uh, and after Four Corners, I stayed on. Have I got time, Pete? Yeah. I stayed on to watch uh, Media Watch. Paul Barry uh, in, uh, on Media Watch. I don't normally watch it. People say they love it until they're on it. <laughs> <laughs> and the world changes. <laughs> but Paul has paid $300,000 a year for 15 minutes work a week. <laughs> nice gig, Paul. <laughs> but I do wonder what media he watches, a lot of stuff about the unfair media treatment of the Palestinians. The big media story of the week was the Lisa Wilkinson wardrobe allowance of $100,000 a year. And they even gave her a $60,000 a year allowance when she didn't even appear on television. And that whole soap opera that is Channel 10 at the moment, imminent bankruptcy perhaps, I don't know, or takeover. But not a word from Mr. Barry. But then, uh, would he do, no, do a number on Lisa? The leading lady of the left on television? Probably not. Probably not. Just let me leave you with a little quick reminder of uh, a visit to the Rising Sun Inn. 
on Bridge Street at Kensington. It is a beautiful, beautiful pub. It's about, oh golly, built in 1845, wasn't it, Pete? Yes, that's right. Fabulous food. There's a great bar which you can lean up against, and I have done that many times. I've been going there for about 40 years. Grant has been there for I don't know how many years. Fair number. It's a, um, a splendid piece of South Australian history. The Rising Sun Inn, and you'll find it, as I say, on Bridge Street at Kensington, which is just off Kensington Road. One visit, and I'm sure it'll become one of your favourite watering holes. And they can organise if you want to have, oh, I don't know, a wedding or a, a function of some kind, engagement party, stand-up corporate do. They've got five separate areas that are very flexible. Have a talk to Grant about that at the Rising Sun Inn. It is the 21st. I'll leave you with a few birthdays and anniversaries. If I can find my glasses. I do remember to bring them down with me these days because they do make a big difference when I'm reading. Um, Richard Nixon becomes the first US president to visit China, normalizing relations between the countries in a meeting with Chinese leader Mao Zedong in Beijing on this day in 1972. Hard on the heels, of course, was Gough Whitlam. Alka-Seltzer introduced in 1931 what did people use before Alka-Seltzer? Uh, they probably just had to put up with it, I think. <laughs> yeah, I reckon. Indigestion. <laughs> Peter Talk, American rock and folk music singer, actor, monkeys, dies from complications of carcinoma at the age of 77. Um, Joanne was the song. Do you, do you know the song Joanne, Pete? Yes, yeah, I remember it, yes. Yeah, that's a beautiful piece of music. I love that. Must try and play it on Friday. Uh, the first known sewing machine was patented in the US by John Greenberg of Washington, 1842. I thought it was going to be Singer, but no, it was Greenberg. Um, 1916, World War I, the Battle of Verdun begins with a German offensive, leads to an estimated one million casualties and becomes the longest battle of the entire war. It went for nine months. One battle. 1916. Santa Ana, president of Mexico, who dominated Mexican history in the first half of the 19th century, and he was the guy who was the uh, enemy when you had Sam Houston and Jim Bowie and uh, Davy Crockett defending the Alamo. Santa Ana, 1794. Billy Graham, American Baptist evangelist on this very day, 2018, described as one of the 20th century's most influential people. He dies at the age of 99. Billy Graham, Kelsey Grammer, American actor, comedian, director, activist, Fraser Crane, he was in Cheers and in Fraser, and I think they brought Fraser back, but I don't watch it because it's on pay television, and I don't watch pay television. 1955 uh, was the year he was born. Howard Florey, Australian pathologist and pharmacologist, who purified penicillin. He got the Nobel Prize in 45, dies at 69. On this day, Howard Florey. 1968. Australia's international border reopens to vaccinated tourists after 704 days. That's nearly two years. The year was 2022. That was the uh, COVID stuff. And I'll give you one more. Uh, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels published the Communist Manifesto in London, 1848. Never read it, never wanted to. Thank you very much for viewing the Court of Public Opinion, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jeremy Cordo, Peter Clayton, and I'll be back tomorrow. Thank you. Believe in yourself, and goodbye for now.
Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details.